faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resilient. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Hey guys, Jared Moon here and welcome to the Better Humanology Podcast. Super pumped to have you guys listening today. Today we have Coach Joe from the Doc and Jock Podcast talking about Olympic weightlifting for garage gym athletes. It's going to be a great episode and of course we're going to cover a lot of different topics in the process. So stick around. Before we get to the episode, I got to make this announcement. I'm super, super pumped about it guys. So maybe you don't know, but Back in 2012, I released a program called One Man, One Barbell, and it's been used by thousands of athletes now, and the success of all of the athletes who have reported has been amazing, Um, and I'm very, very humbled at uh, the the success all of our athletes have seen, and, and it's really been incredible, but now we are taking kind of the next step, and I like to call these the prequels, the prequels. Uh, are coming out so you know how kind of like Star Wars came out with three episodes back in the day and then they came out with the prequels right they came out with episode one and two and three well that's what we're doing uh, with one man one barbell we're coming out with the one man body weight system and we're also coming out with one man one kettlebell now these are programs that we've been testing a lot behind the scenes with a lot of different athletes inside of the end of three fitness community and the results are in they're awesome phenomenal all the athletes who have reported have seen huge gains so i'm super excited to be releasing these now they're not out yet uh, but what we're doing is we have an early bird list at into3fitness.com so if you go to into3fitness.com and there's a little section that says train um, if you click on that you're going to see all the list of our programs you'll see the one man body weight system one man one kettlebell and one man one barbell in fact we've taken down every other program at into three fitness we don't even have anything else up or offered right now because that's how pumped up we are about getting these programs out to you guys. But if you want to be on the early bird list, uh, you'll be the first one to know before it ever goes public. Um, and like I said, we got the body weight system, um, which really we're calling them a system, not programs, because they're these templatized, badass little systems that you can just you can plug in your own uh, reps, your own maxes, your own everything. And when I say maxes, yes, even for body weight stuff with the way we have it programmed. It's just so, I'm so passionate about this, guys. I could talk about it for hours on end, uh, the thought that went into it, the programming that went into it, how many athletes tested this, and how thankful I am for to have athletes to test programs. Uh, super passionate about this stuff, guys. And then One Man, One Kettlebell, uh, it really can address a lot of imbalances I'm seeing pop up in athletes. It can increase your fitness significantly. Um, and we also had some great results with athletes testing that uh, system as well. So I'm super pumped to get these out to you guys. If you're interested in our training, and you're wondering where to step, or maybe you've checked out our training and you're a little bit intimidated, Uh, well, that's where this bodyweight program comes into play. Uh, It's not going to be easy, but it's very simple, and anyone can play on that one. Same with the kettlebell program, Uh, and guys, they'll be coming out soon. So get on that early bird list. Go to into3fitness.com. Head over to the training section. It says train at the top, and you will be able to enter your email to be on that early bird list. Uh, But I have rambled enough about these systems, guys. I will let Coach Joe take it from here. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. If you're enjoying it, please head on over to iTunes. Leave us a five-star review and a positive comment. I appreciate you being here. All right, Joe, super pumped to have you on the Better Humanology podcast, man. Welcome. Welcome. Now it's fire to be here. I've been on I've been on the uh, the question asking side of this a few times, so it's cool to always sit on the hot seat. So thanks for having me, Jared. Yeah, man, I'm glad that you're here. And for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Joe and Danny run a podcast called – Danny's not here today, but they, they run a podcast <laughs> called Doc and Jock, um, which is a really awesome podcast everyone should uh, also be subscribed to. Um, but before we talk about any of that or anything about you, um, it's the start, cool. <laughs> start, of the, start of the week. We have to start with our challenges. The listeners come first on this show, uh, so I got to make sure that uh, we get some challenges for them. Uh, so can you give us a fitness challenge for the listeners this week? Yeah, I'll give you a fitness challenge. I'm actually on one myself, and this might be a little different than something you've been, uh, you guys have been challenged with before. But my fitness challenge for you guys is to prioritize sleep. Um, it affects everything. I'm I'm someone who's got a big issue with it. I've been a bad sleeper my whole life, and finally interviewing a couple experts on the topic, I'm finally making it a priority. So before 
banging reps and hitting loads and increasing the total, um, I'm, I'm really trying to get my eight hours a night and, um, it's, it's harder than you think, Jared. No, that's, uh, what's funny about that is Emily and I, we went down the, the sleep path a few years ago, like really making, like darkening, darkening out the entire room, you know, yep. uh, making sure that, you know, uh, sleeping in a colder environment and trying to get enough. Cause, uh, we know that's very important, but what's funny about that is I used to be like this, uh, go to bed late, wake up early, you know, <laughs> grind every second in between. And then when I started doing all this research on sleep, um, and similar to you talking to some guys who are, are way smarter than me about the topic, I'm like, hmm, you know, maybe, maybe there's something to this. Uh, so like some days, like I like to wake up early and have a morning routine, but if I had to go to sleep really late the night before, sure. Some, sometimes I'll just be like, uh, I think I'm just going to opt out, not do that and get the extra sleep. Cause I really think that that's probably going to be more important in the long run to your health than, you know, sticking to the morning routine every single day. But yeah, I was going to say a hundred percent, dude. Um, well, I would say maybe something really specific aside from just saying prioritize sleep, something that I've taken on is light management and really getting on my, getting on a schedule about, you know, once we hit this time, yeah, the computers, the TVs have to go off. And if there's a late session thing that I have to do at the computer, I've, I've gone to getting a cheap pair of blue blockers. And I'll be honest, man, um, as I've kind of prioritized that and even incorporated these kind of indoor glasses to block the blue light, uh, my sleep uh, quality has really improved. So that's something specific to get into. Just manage your manage your light time and um, try to try to schedule that computer and screen time with what's going on outdoors with the sun. I think it would be really helpful. That's a great challenge, man. Do you use any of the apps for like your computer? So like the iPhone has uh, has something built in, right? For a blue blocker, I forgot what it's called on the iPhone. And then also you can get uh, Flux on like your MacBook. Have you tried those things out? I've just tinkered with Flux. I was talking with uh, Dawn Fletcher, who's a um, she's a sports psych chick, and she's out on the West Coast there, and she's actually someone I went to college with, but uh, she's been working with some CrossFit athletes, and she put me on Flux. It's interesting. I haven't downloaded it yet, but I've been looking into it. It kind of what the the computer screen will just kind of mimic that. Well, it's funny, yeah. So I've actually had Dawn on the podcast uh, oh, awesome. a while back. Um, so. What's funny about it, though, is if you ever are working late, so it'll start to kind of turn your screen like orange, you know, like uh, because nice. it's taking out all the blue. But if you're up really late, it gets darker and uh, or like more and more orange the the later you are up. So if you're up like on midnight working on your computer, it's like really odd looking at the screen because like all color has been zapped out and it's just orange. It's really, uh, really crazy. Very cool. I'll have to check it out. All right, man. Mental toughness challenge. Yeah, this is uh, uh, kind of on that same line. I'm someone who has real issues with down regulation, and I would say uh, spend five minutes alone with yourself. No sound, no nothing, no, no music, just you. It's a lot harder, gang, than, than you'd think it would be. So, um, yeah, for me, what I do focus on when I do that is just kind of breathing. I'll assume some kind of either sitting position or laying position, and I'm really just focusing on deep in, hold, deep out. And um, really just kind of tuning into what's going on in my own head, which um, which can be a scary place at times, but we're working through it, brother. <laughs> yeah, trying to navigate those waters, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, man, how about a book recommendation? A uh, book recommendation. Uh, recently read uh, Mark Manson's uh, "The Subtle Art of Not Giving um, an F." I'll say that. Yeah. Uh, I'll keep the I'll keep the cuss words to a minimum, but um, yeah, I think it's a cool book. I think with 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 everything that we're bombarded with, just being able to prioritize what you're going to attack and, and not sweating the small stuff, but really caring about what matters. Um, the book does, does a great job of laying that out and giving you some cool stories and, and tricks to do that. So check that one out. Yeah, I've had that one on my um, wish list on Audible for a while now. And how my wish list works is the more recommendations I get from friends and guests, the higher that it gets bumped up on the wish list. So I think that one just like probably took the number one spot. So I'm going to have to I have to add that one to the queue like really soon. No, it's good. And it's funny. It, it does a great job of starting out really humorous and kind of lighthearted. But towards the end, they get into some pretty heavy and, and applicable stuff. So it's a great read. And hey, can I can I recommend I'm going to do one other challenge for your guests. Can we do this? I would love that. A technique challenge All rather right. than going big, going heavy. Um, I work a lot with the barbell, but, you know, through the, a lot of the clients that I work with, um, with CrossFit and weightlifting, there's all this dropping of barbells. But uh, I think a cool technique challenge is to to integrate a little bit of silent returns to the floor. 
Um, uh, as I coach folks, I'm always trying to incorporate control in their lifting. And I found that that's a really great way to do it. So, um, whether uh, you're going to do a little segmented variety or you're snatching and cleaning with, with some manageable percentages, I think integrating that silent return is, is a cool way to do that. And it's something that most people don't do. And you think that that is that um, almost like some accessory work too? Because you think about like having to control that negative, which is normally not a thing in weightlifting. Uh, you think that that just builds a little bit more muscle? Is it disciplined? What do you, what's the uh, the main goal behind Bang. it? Yeah, bang for your buck. It, it's a great thing. So with the way I kind of look at it, it's like kind of a voodoo science and sneaky way of sneaking in extra reps. If you're if you're really controlling the rep the right way to the floor, it's going to mimic the rep. So you're going to get kind of a double impact there. So one of the first places I would maybe think about doing this is if you're cleaning or jerking or deadlifting, maybe afterwards you could incorporate some auxiliary segmented lifts where maybe you're just going to break the barbell off the floor and get it to the knee, maybe pause for a moment and then silently bring it down. And that's just going to teach control and tempo in the lift. So, um, we can get it, we can get into this a little bit later, but it's just a lot of bang for your buck. And, um, if you're not familiar with it, I would start small with a segmented kind of simple, slow approach. And, um, like I said, it's just a, it provides contrast. Um, that eccentric phase is something not a lot of people get, um, so all that eccentric science is there, but the real thing I like to do is especially new lifters to weightlifting. I think it's a sneaky way to get extra reps. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, the tempo lifting alone is like, yeah. great, you know, like <laughs> it, that, that's, that's a beast and uh, a lot of yeah. people don't do it. Uh, I think that's a great recommendation. All right, man. We're all, I'll add that to my own, uh, training there. There you go, brother. All right, so let's uh, let's get the listeners filled in a little bit more about your story, your background. Uh, if you could take a few minutes, um, starting wherever you'd like, uh, from what you ate oh. this morning. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> really, just your background um, in fitness and, and life, and uh, I'll, I'll jump in after you're well, done. I was going to say, don't let me start my journey wherever we can, because rumor has it from my parents, that, uh, or at least from my father, that I was, I was conceived in the back of a Denny's, where, the, where him and my mother worked together. But uh, upward and onward. <laughs> We'll uh, we'll move on from that. But uh, no, um, I'm a strength coach who focuses primarily on weightlifting now. I do a lot of my own coaching and training in the garage, and a lot of that's a result of trying to pair my passion for strength and fitness and strength and conditioning with trying to be a great dad and husband. Uh, my wife's uh, active duty military. She's a, she's a physical therapist. We're right now at West Point, New York. She's doing some running research with the cadets here, and we're actually en route to Washington State where she'll take on a big job at Fort Lewis. So that's pretty cool. But, you know, with traveling and following her career and having this kind of coaching background, I've just kind of whittled it down to, to this strength field and, um, being a dad's important to me, being fit's important to me. And, uh, what I'm, I'm trying to just, uh, let people know that you can, you can, you can kind of do it all right. If you, if you have a plan and you can focus on some things. So if that's the general story and we can hopefully get into some of the specifics there. Yeah. And, uh, being a garage gym athlete helps, right? <laughs> oh yeah, no, I was gonna say it's 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 been really fun for me. I know I'm spending less time in the car, uh, more time with the kids, more time with the wife, more time with the barbell, and um, it, it's really fun. And I think it's something that anybody who is going to take on being a family man and going to take on kind of doing their own business thing or whatever else they want to do and still wants still want to be fit. I think having a home setup is. It's got to be a priority. It's got to be paramount. And it really allows for that to happen. So give me a little more on your athletic background. Sure. Yeah, so I played I played high school and college football. After that, I was kind of coaching football for a while. And when we cycled to Hawaii, I just kind of got bit by the CrossFit bug. So that was really fun. And, and I hooked up with CrossFit 808 and a chick named Alicia Mehta. And through that, I got to make a neat little games run with the team. I saw the writing on the wall pretty early that – I wasn't going to beat Jason Kalipa, Neil Maddox, and the rest of those maniacs, Blair Morrison at the time, at an individual level. So I jumped on this team bandwagon with 808 and got to make a little gains run. Um, then after the games, we cycled to Columbia, South Carolina. Weightlifting was kind of my wheelhouse in CrossFit. So I got into the weightlifting scene, uh, qualified for nationals a few times. As a coach, I've qualified a couple of people for the American Open, and, and now the focus is primarily on helping people kind of develop some technique with the barbell and show people that weightlifting 
is approachable. It's a neat little sport, and for folks who don't see themselves playing golf and walking around and getting old, if you look at weightlifting as kind of a skill acquisition focus, it, it can be really pleasurable and, and really enjoyable. What year did you go to the games? Uh, it was 2013. Awesome, man. So that's awesome. <laughs> no, it was fun. It was a, it was something. It, going to the games was both a, is it was eye opening to me on lots of levels. For one, it was something I worked really hard for, and even though it was with a team, it, man, it was all I could do to stay on that team. That 808 squad is pretty competitive, and even now, if I moved out there, I, I would not make that team. They've gotten really good, but um. You know, it was eye-opening in the sense that as much as I worked hard for it and thought it would be like this life-changing experience, it kind of wasn't in some regards because as soon as the games were over, you know, we cycle back to real life. You know what I mean? You're treated for a weekend and you're this pro athlete for a weekend and CrossFit does a great job of treating you awesome and, you know, giving you the swag bag and, and then you're busting your butt in the workouts and, you know, you got the big kind of that moving camera all over the place and they they do a great job of making you feel tip top but um then all of a sudden when it's over you're just back to normal life changing diapers doing your thing gotta be a dad <laughs> you know what i mean so you know it, it was really eye-opening in, in a lot of regards and really helped me put my own career and my own athleticism and, and everything i could do in perspective that's uh I, you know i've actually never heard that that uh, take on it before because that is uh, very true to be honest if you're not i would say like competing at the individual level and you're not like one of the top five and it might be different these days maybe it's top 15 finishers you know with sponsors who might be paying full-time salaries for you to train and like all of these other other things um yeah man you're just trying to fit in some hardcore training with being you know a full-time dad and coach and like all these other things right so uh what was your training schedule like because this is 2013, obviously the games have mm -hmm. uh, progressed quite a, quite a bit since then. But what was your training like as a team athlete on a daily, weekly basis to to get to that level? It was tough, man. You know, it, you know, imagine we're living in paradise. It was great being out there. I mean, it was five days a week, and then uh, toward towards after after. Before the Open, it would be five days a week. We were training as a team. She wanted us there to get our, our workouts in. And then after the Open, we would go to two-a-days on the weekends. And it was pretty rough. We had five days a week with the two-a-days with the kids. Uh, we had our second kid towards the tail end of that. And I can say – I can say with all honesty, I was training too much because, you know, with the second kiddo, recovery just wasn't there. So I think if I would have had the guts to back off on training a little bit, I would have actually performed um, a lot better. And that's kind of cycled to what my kind of training philosophy is as a coach. It's like most people that I train and, you know, I'll make an assumption about the audience. Most people who are training and listening to your podcast are, are generally normal humans who aren't making their livelihood or their earning potential or, or paying their bills with their fitness. You know, they they have kind of big jobs and, and stuff in that regard. But I think if you kind of find a good mix, you can train hard and live hard and work hard and do all that stuff. But, um, you, you can only burn it at both ends so long. So you have to also mix in a good bout of recovery and, and good nutrition in that regard. You know, and it's that continuum, you know, this is something I normally kind of draw out for my athletes is, mm -hmm. you know, on, on the one end you have like, you know, fat, sick and nearly dead, right? Like you, you never, yeah. you never, <laughs> never train and like you're on this spectrum cause you never exercise or whatever. And then, but it's also, on the other spectrum of training three, four times a day, every single day for years on end, uh, I would argue that you're, even though these guys might be winning the CrossFit games, I would argue that you're still unhealthy. You're in the unhealthy realm of, uh, fitness. Cause like what you're saying, you too much training volume, not enough sleep. Uh, we don't know where this is going in a decade or, you know, if someone were to actually be able to compete at that level for a decade, it doesn't seem like the shelf life of a CrossFit athlete is that long. Uh, right now, other than a few rare cases. So where I like my athletes to be is that upper middle portion. You know, that's what I like sure. for everyone to, to strive for. Um, so moving to what your training looks like today, that's quite a transition. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> ha has it just been a, a, and 
has it been a stair step down to a new level or have you kind of kept a, you know, a solid base because you are juggling like what a lot of the listeners are. We have a lot of people who are in the garage pounding it out, yep. you know, and, uh, you know, completely busy during the day. Uh, so you were doing five days a week, two days, two times a day or two days to get to the CrossFit games. And where are you at now? And has your fitness level taken a significant hit or are you still kind of maintaining uh, where you were at? Yeah, it's interesting. I'll tell you, I, I train the barbell for weightlifting specific. I train that three days a week pretty much most days. Now, when we get hot and heavy for a national level meet or, you know, I, I was just competing for um, Masters Nationals and, you know, the month leading up to that was about a four day a week and then we kind of tapered down. But it, it's generally a three day a week protocol. And what I'm trying to do is hit something for strength every day, uh, something for a skill acquisition and speedy approach every day. And then I try to bookend that with some really um, some really focused prep work and some really focused um, isolation and auxiliary work. And in a general sense, what I do for my conditioning is just hike and walk around with the kids and play with the kids and, and try to manage my conditioning by really just staying on my feet. You know, as a weightlifter now, you know, you know, you operate on this four by four meter platform that, you know, but in order to kind of stay healthy and more human, what I do is just get outside of the house to to manage that. For example, this past weekend, I went for a hike in Vermont, you know, trying to snatch a couple turkeys out of the woods and, mm -hmm. you know, through those days, you know, we're covering, you know, six to seven hard miles up and down in some rough terrain, you know, and, and that's really the gauge of what my fitness is. You know, every now and then I'll kind of enter a 5K and see what it is. And in my mind, I do enough conditioning to kind of keep a 5K in the tank whenever I need it or a, a hard run up a hill, a pretty nasty hill. And I'm, I'm hanging on to that. I found that, you know, the fitness and strength that I need for everyday life at this point isn't what's required for the CrossFit games. So um, I think my overall quality of life with this kind of um, back off in training has definitely improved. Um, could I qualify uh, for the CrossFit Games with any team right now? No, but I, right now I can do everything I want to do and generally better than most of the other dads who are out there watching soccer practice with me. So um, in that regard, I think I'm doing pretty good. No, yeah, I think that's awesome. That's <laughs> you know to, what I mean? that, to be honest. Uh, yeah, so I have my own uh, personal standards and benchmarks that I go for. But another thing that I frequently look at is, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm not I, I rarely ever get injured. You know, I, I just That's right. because I'm not I don't do I, I do push it hard when I am training, but I don't train too much. I don't do too much volume. It's much less than I did once upon a time. Uh, sure. But, you know, I'm very comfortable and happy with where my fitness level is at, um, you know, trying to balance everything, you know, and, and life's only gotten busier since I left the military and, and gone, you know, full entrepreneur and staying at home and, and all these other things. But uh, one thing I do want to transition and ask you about is uh, kind of shifting gears completely is uh, being a dad and fitness. Uh, so nice. where do you see, because your kids are still young. I have young, young kids. Uh, yep. What is your kind of plan or idea, vision, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, uh, for your kids and fitness as they grow up? Because I think that this is the first generation, really, our generation, um, who who might be able to change things just a little bit. I don't I don't feel like fit uh, health and nutrition education was really that needed back in the day because people were just mm. relatively healthy. Say my grandpa, your grandpa, that type, like they worked hard and food yeah. hadn't turned into this ridiculous thing, but now it's almost a necessity to know these things. So what, what's your plan for your kids? Yeah, well, you bring up some cool stuff because modern life has really kind of screwed the pooch for us, right? You know, the, the, the food that's convenient is trash, and the modern conveniences that are also a blessing also kind of take our humanness away, right? If you go to a third world country, you probably don't have to FMS those people. They're moving around enough where they can probably, you know, get a, you know, a, a 19 on that and be fine with it. But here, you know, with, with modern technology and modern foods and, and it's all easy to attain and it's very easy to do it and stay very sedentary. So my idea with fitness for the kiddos is to see it. And to introduce them to everything that I can, you know, so we're the kids played hockey while we we're up here. The kids are playing soccer right now. Um, they do gymnastics. We just want to introduce them to a bunch of stuff. And then also what we do 
is I keep a bunch of stuff around the house. There's kettlebells laying in the toy room. There's a bunch of stuff in the garage that are play things like toys so they can play while daddy's training. And then we just keep kind of kettlebells around the house so they just kind of can pick things up. So the idea for me right now as a dad is for them just to see it and to know that dad places a priority on fitness and strength. And I do that for a couple of reasons. You know, there's a neat little study going around that and maybe we can get a link for it for your show list for your listeners. But, you know, a kid's perception of their own fitness is going to be higher based on their perception of their parents' fitness. So if they see the mom and dad moving around, they think they're more fit just because they watch their parents do it. So it's it's important for me to just kind of lead by example and be someone who will introduce them. And honestly, with all three kids, I'm waiting for that moment where they say, Dad, I want to do this. And as soon as they want to hit that go button, we'll hard charge it to help them out. That's awesome, man. I think uh, you and I have a very, very similar approach. And yep. the only thing I try to be mindful about is never pushing them in any direction, you know, because then they might end up hating fitness, which if I was the reason they started to hate fitness, <laughs> that would be like mission right. failed. You know, like I, I like they're like, oh, no, I never work out. My dad used to do that a lot. Try to get me to do it. I That's stupid. I'm like, oh, man, I just like made the biggest mistake I was trying to avoid uh, by pushing you in the wrong direction. Well, I had a um, I had an interesting kind of personal story with this. I remember being in, I think, seventh or eighth grade and I, I loved football. I was on a um, I was kind of on a, a pretty good peewee team. And then my parents wanted me also to get into the high school team and, and they kind of pushed me onto both teams. Now, if you can imagine doing football practice uh, for two teams, it was crazy. And that was the first time my parents ever pushed me. And after that season, it was also the first time that I didn't want to play football the next season. You know, I was done. I was, I was kind of beat up. And um, as they started pushing me harder to get better at it, I kind of pushed back and didn't want to do it because it was stopped being fun. So it, it made me realize with kids, as much as you want to push them or any athlete, you can't want it more than the athlete and you can't push them harder than they want to go because they're going to push back the other way. So man, even with the kids too, is I, I do my best to make it fun and I do my best to encourage more than to force. You know, that's a, uh funny story for when I I've moved around a lot when I was uh younger my dad was in the military and awesome. I know that the so southern states and the SEC and all that stuff they have it's <laughs> very very serious in the football world but yeah. uh and that's where I started and I played football there but I was actually I don't know a small town I was actually really good I was like one of the best football players there but it was a very small cool. school and then uh seventh grade I moved to Texas and uh nice just absolutely get my ass handed to me i'm like the third string like backup water boy uh after initial tryouts because like they are just so much better the schools are so much bigger and like the competition so much i'd never seen kids like granted they're in seventh grade i'd never seen because i felt like we were just having fun when i was in alabama like we were just having a good time and i happened to be kind of athletic and so that's why i was good at it but Mm -hmm. i've never seen kids who like what you were saying were so driven like they were just like you know, uh, talking to people in the seventh grade saying like they wanted to be like, you know, play football at this college and and do this stuff. So uh, I think that that does get internalized at some point. And that might be, I don't know, outside of my control, outside of our control, at least. Well, it's it's interesting because I I coached um, football in Texas. I coached in San Antonio at Northside ISD and I was a middle school coach. And even as a coach, they take it pretty serious. And even at the middle school level, it was crazy because we, the high school we were attached, you had to kind of play both. So along with coaching the middle school teams, we would have to support some of the high school coaches in that regard. And we would end up on Fridays, especially, we would be coaching our kids and then have to scramble over to the high school to run film and do a couple other things and then help them break down the film. And Man, that those Fridays, you're checking in to work at 6 a.m. to do the seventh grade practice, and then you're at the high school till sometimes midnight to 1 a.m. breaking down film. I mean, it is a grind. Anyone who's doing football at any level in Texas, if you're doing it right, you are putting in your time because they really care about it. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> All right, dude, I'm going to shift gears on you again. Go. I'm going to give you the book question. So nice. uh, say there's a nationwide curriculum implemented and the yep. president calls you up and he says, you're responsible for one chapter of this book. So every mm. single child in America is going to have to read your chapter and be tested on and pass it before they can graduate high school and move on to higher education. 
So given that, what would your chapter be about? Yeah, it would be a, a weightlifting chapter. It would be something about the barbell. I'm someone who really thinks that the same way we introduce soccer balls and footballs to kids and tennis rackets and, and line dancing, why aren't we introducing the barbell more seriously And in, in regard to doing the lifts fast? I think, uh, I think weightlifting offers a great opportunity to mix strength and speed. And once you get the technique down, you can really have efficient workouts and anyone playing sports, you know, the, 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 the application of speed is really important. So I think there should be a national weightlifting curriculum, and I don't think it has to be too crazy. I think you can start as young as 8 to 12 years old, um, just teaching them how to navigate their bodies and, and how to keep a neutral spine with, with different uh, positions and variations. But um, I would 100% begin to write some kind of weightlifting curriculum that really – focus on the skill acquisition regarding the barbell, not just building strength and doing the slow lifts. Yeah, so let's talk about weight, weightlifting a little bit more uh, sure. because it can get a bad reputation. And to be honest, mm -hmm. in my own programming, so we have hundreds of athletes inside of uh, Garage Gym Athlete, and I minimally prescribe weightlifting. Now, I'll prescribe sure. a lot of dynamic efforts for building power and speed, uh, but the only reason I really program that way is not because I have any problem with weightlifting movements is because since I'm not individually watching someone do a snatch or clean and jerk, I don't feel like I can correct them. I feel like the power lifts are a little bit more robotic in nature, a little sure. bit safer, but that doesn't mean people shouldn't be doing them. And so I yep. want to like ask you, what do you think a, a good way for someone who is in the garage gym, wants to get better at weightlifting, not a ton of resources, uh, what, yep. would, what would you recommend to them? Oh, man, I would, uh, again, tons of resources are interesting. I think with remote coaching and different kinds of coaching and finding a coach and going to CrossFit gym, you, you really have to, I would say, it would be the equivalent of your kiddos in gymnastics. You're not just going to hope that they figure out how to do a backflip. They're going to work through a progression with a, with, with a good coach and, and get it there. You know, there you can really screw things up if you, and this is true for a deadlift. Once you, if you go crazy, um, early, too heavy, too fast, uh, for too many reps, you're going to break something. So the, the, the first one is if you find a coach that you trust and like, you should follow their stuff. You know what I mean? I think that that's really important because you don't, you don't want to take more steps back than you're taking forward. Um, but honestly, I think you, if you're going to be going at this on your own, uh, taking a segmented approach, I think is really important. You know, before, before you can snatch, you need to be overhead squatting. And again, before you can snatch, you should be practicing drop snatches or snatch balances. And even before you snatch, you have to be working uh, maybe a snatch grip deadlift and kind of like we talked about before, going to the knee. So I would say the older you are and or the newer you are, the more segmented your approach and the less that you want to actually incorporate um, weightlifting into it, the more you're kind of just flirting with it. You should you should be a lot uh, more segmented than the next in that regard. So again, going back to that initial point, if if you're just kind of thinking about it, you know maybe your your snatch workout might be I'm going to do snatch grip deadlifts. I'm going to follow that with some snatch balance afterwards, and then I'm going to shore up some barbell breaking technique by hitting a couple segmented reps to the knee. And I would set it I would leave it at that. Um, so a segmented approach um, with skill as the emphasis not necessarily your total. I think that screws people up quite a bit. Yeah, it's always going for that uh, bigger number, right? That's Yeah. yeah. I mean, think, think of weightlifting more like golf and gymnastics and less like powerlifting, and I think you'll be in a really happy place learning how to do it. Um, the more you're hung up on what the guy on the platform next to you is doing and the more you're hung up on how much you're doing, you're, you're probably going to hurt yourself. So focus more on how well you're doing it and kind of break it down into parts. And I think you'll be a lot happier. That's awesome, man. And how long would you say someone brand new to it? How long should they segment things out? Uh, I know I'm asking you like the million dollar question oh, here because yeah. everyone's different, but like, sure. do you think these progression, just to give people an idea, do you think these progressions take a year Longer, shorter? How long do you think people should be before they're just like, you know yeah. what, I'm going to start going for that total a little bit more? Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of this would 
I would say anyone who's training alone, you should film yourself, right? And the more you start to look like people who are doing it at a high level, the better you're going to be. That's probably the best way to figure it out. If you look at your own videos and say, well, I kind of look wonky, I kind of look crazy, these positions aren't great, then you shouldn't move on. So as long as it takes to really start to progress the movement where it looks safe, happy, free, and smooth, I think that's the best way to go. Um, You know, some people, it takes years some people are naturals with it you know um one of the things they'll do in this polish system that i picked up from a a coach who kind of grew up out there and now lives out on the west coast and he works with some filipino lifters you know they'll do a thing with young kids where the coach will just mimic the lifts and the kids who can mimic the lift pretty well they put them in one group but the kids who can't they put them in another group and the kids in that second group kind of go through this segmented teaching approach but the kiddos who can just kind of do it naturally, well, they get into some different programming. So um, it's really individual. So in that regard, I would suggest 100% going back to the beginning of this little rabbit hole we went down is to film yourself and compare it to people who are good. And the more you look like those people, you can kind of progress it. Um, The more you don't, then you probably need to slow it down. You know, what's funny is back in the day, just a few years ago, so not really back, Mm -hmm. back in the day, uh, I was running CrossFit on-ramp classes um, in Florida. And one of the things that I would do, um, cause th- and no one ever taught me this, so I don't know if it, I've never really heard another coach say it might be a good idea until you just said that. Uh, but sure. he was doing it with kids is I, instead of like sitting there and teaching everyone like, okay, this is the snatch. Cause you know, you're just giving like, you're giving a really basic rundown really fast in an on-ramp That's class. Right. And so I would like, if I had a group of like 15 or 20 people there, um, I would do the movement and then I would just, I would like be like, okay. I would give no instruction. I would just like, yeah. this, this is what it is. You guys do it. And then I would make them sit there. They're doing it with PVC pipe, right? So it's not a huge sure. deal. And I'm trying to find out who looks like they're having a seizure versus who looks like they're doing <laughs> the movement. That's right. And then I'd kind of break up the groups and be like, okay, you need less work. You need a lot more work. And so then I, that's how I would I would split people up. So that's funny that you said that uh, other people are, do that well, as well. I mean, I think whether it's through athletics or whether it's trained or learned, some people are gifted with a physical intelligence. And I don't know how to, you know, I I think one of the best ways to figure that out is just like you said, tell someone to go do this. And if they can do it without, again, looking like they're in a grand mall, well, that's great. Fire it up. Move them on. Let's go to the next thing. And then you can then integrate load and different variety and tempo to mess with it. But you know, I think, you know, there, there's some, you know, the Internet's a great place to live sometimes, but it's also a pain in the butt in some regard. But, you know, there, a PVC pipe and working with a Dow uh, can kind of get a bad name. But, man, I think it's a great place to do it because it it forces you to move your body. And I think the biggest misconception with weightlifting is people think it's about moving the barbell, getting height on the bar. But more important than anything, it's about how you can move your body in reference to that bar and uh, the PVC pipe forces you to use the body and mimicking someone's movement really is, is a, is a great standard to show if they are generally just good movers. So no, I think you're right on point with that. You know, you and I probably learn differently. I know my three kids learn differently and um, you know, teaching with different uh, ideas in mind like that, I think is really helpful to both the coach and the athlete. Yeah, and I think I really think that coaching weightlifting is an art because you can know how to do it so well. Or yep. you, you and like me personally, I'm not at any national level, but I feel like I I can't move a ton of weight on the on the grand scheme of things. But I feel like I move the weight well when I with what I'm moving. Um, but it takes years to learn how to articulate that into teaching or coaching another human being. And I, I don't feel like that's as hard with other things. Is that something that you've seen to be true over the years? Or has, has there anything that's kind of been a breakthrough for you in helping, I don't know, get the knowledge out of your head to help an athlete uh, do what they need to do, the, the art of weightlifting? The best thing for me to really dive in and develop my own art of weightlifting was being coached by master artists themselves. You know, I've worked with, you know, I, I was kind of self-taught through CrossFit and, um, in that regard, just kind of banging away at it, kind of hit some plateaus and stayed there. Um, It wasn't until I really worked with other coaches who had dedicated their life to the craft that I really started to understand some of the the more granular details about the sport. And I think this would probably be um, 
this would probably be the case for anything you're going to do. There's, there's no way, you know, if I went to go teach gymnastics to my daughter, Charlie, it would be a foreign language to me because I've never done it. You know, I, I think that you're, you're as a coach, you're probably going to be best at what you can do and who you talk to, um, the most about it and the things that you kind of take on as a passion. So, man, I, I would say that, you know, to expand upon this, that that's probably just a coaching thing in general that, you know, if your coach isn't a, a master at what they're trying to put onto you, um, I think that that's pretty tough. And that could be for general fitness or for weightlifting. So, man, it's just a matter of diving into it. I think that um, you can learn a lot by doing and a lot you can learn a lot by just just being taught how to do it. Do you do a lot of uh, tempo lifting? Because we talked about that towards the beginning. Yeah. Is that something you, you throw a lot in your uh, your own training and the people you coach? Yeah, I think it is important. It's it's a big deal in in what I do. And again, it's, a, I think, a great place to teach your body how to learn positions. And, you know, again, even getting to something as simple as squatting, there are some tempo. There are some tempo considerations that are going to make it look a little bit more like weightlifting. So, you know, you can get complicated with tempos, but one tempo that I generally always incorporate, even with something like squatting is just, I'm going to try to come up faster than I go down. And I think that that's really important. Another thing that I do is to build strength is I incorporate a lot of pauses, um, in my squat patterns, because the misconception, if you're a weightlifter is that you squat a lot, but as much as you may squat, you're probably not spending a lot of time in that bottom position. So, um, just sitting down there with a, with a pause, I think is also pretty important and something I do quite, a, quite a bit of. Yeah. And I, I really, I'm a big fan of tempo and lifting and I understand a lot of the benefit, but yep. sometimes it can just get like super, uh, like it can get too complicated. So I love the way that you yep. just broke it down. You know, people are like, Oh, four seconds down, no pause yep. at the bottom, three seconds up, no pause at yeah, the what? top. <laughs> yeah. It's like, dude, what I like, I have to be thinking the entire time I'm doing the lift about the, the, yep. and, and I understand, like I said, there are a ton of benefits to them, but what you just said, um, I think is a great place for people to start of, I'm going to yep. come up faster than I went down. I'm going to pause at the bottom sometimes like, uh, and then you're going to get all of the benefits. And one thing I point out over and over to people is that human beings are not robots. You know, there's no, no, like, I don't believe there's actually a percentage of a one rep max because your one rep max could be different every single day. I think it's a great marker, uh, yep. to, to help people train. Uh, but the same with a, a tempo squatting with the getting to the more complicated things, like how much different is it to your body at four seconds down versus five seconds down? Is it going to make that, <laughs> that big of a difference, you know, when it comes down to, yep. to seeing results, uh, no, I mean, I don't lift to a stopwatch, right? And, and I don't think anybody, I wouldn't recommend anybody do that. But no, I think it's cool. So again, the big thing that I'll work with is this idea of control. So again, to take that other point, it's, you know, you should go down with control and you should come up with aggression. You know, that's a, another way just to put it. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, I, I think a lot of times we can complicate things because we've seen some some CrossFit athlete who's at the games or some pro athlete doing some interesting stuff. But you know, they're a pro athlete, they're working that stuff. So the more you can kind of focus on good movement and put yourself in a position where you are executing good movement and not thinking about it, the better. All right, man, I'm going to, well, actually, I want to ask you one more question. Go for it. Training related. Nice. Um, so you, you primarily coach, um, weightlifting, right? Yep. Okay. So what do you do? This is just something I, I like to, anyone who's not like more on the conditioning side. What do you do for your lifters? Because they have to have some conditioning base, I would think. Yep. What do you do for conditioning for weightlifters? Yeah, I, I so I end up writing a lot of three-day week templates for most people, and I'm very reluctant to go over that until they can prove to me they can make gains on that. You know, a lot of people, give me five days a week, this, that, and the other thing. Um, but let's start here, and we'll get gains, and we'll make these complicated. But So I'll start with really simple conditioning at the end of a workout. So I'll generally... Day one might be like a sled push, 20 meters, and I generally won't give them too much direction in that regard, you know, get 20 meters in, and they'll figure out how fast they want to do it that day or how heavy they want to go. And then day two, I generally will incorporate a carry, 
Um, and that'll get a little bit more specific. Maybe for weightlifting, it's going to be an overhead carry, single arm carry, something asymmetrical to get their core going uh, a little interesting way. Or maybe they have some kind of weakness. So day two will generally be a carry. And then the third day, I'm going to incorporate some kind of a pull. You know what I mean? So um, pull the sled around now. And I think when you give people simple directives like that, they can be pretty effective and, and, and they'll find simple ways to torture themselves or simple ways to say, oh, I need to back off today. You know what I mean? So really, I think there's there's a ton of research on the benefits of um, doing sled pushes, doing sled pulls and, and to, to carry some things around. Anyone who's not familiar with the work of like uh, Stuart McGill should read it. Um, these asymmetrical carries are, are paramount. And then two, the, I think the best conditioning exercises are going to be those that are going to be low weight bearing, um, but that you can work really hard with. And I think sled pushes and pulls are, are the best and also, excuse me, are going to be low skill. So I think if you can just kind of mindlessly push and pull a sled, that's going to be the best conditioning you're going to get. So those three things for weightlifters or anyone who kind of fancies themselves a bit of a barbell athlete or, you know, anyone who really wants to get conditioning in in a timely manner. As long as you're pulling pulling something, carrying something, and pushing something, I think you're going to be in good shape. Push, pull, and carry, man. I love it. How how far that's do it. you know? How how far do you normally go on the uh, the carries? Do you? Uh, you know, a lot of times that's dictated by like it. So for some athletes, I know go to you know the length of your driveway, ten meters, twenty meters. You know what I mean? Um, it. it it's not overly specific. Sometimes I'll even do um, like a Tabata thing where it's like, okay, uh, you know, if you got your little stopwatch or your wristwatch or whatever, you know, maybe you're going to push for 30 seconds, walk for a minute, something like that. So um, I try to really keep that as mindless as possible um, in, a, in a really simple, simple prescription. Generally, never more than 20, 25 meters, um, something like that. Nothing, nothing too big. Awesome, man. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Are you ready for the quick fire questions of the show? I think so. All right. Let's go for it. I mean, what's the hardest workout you've ever done? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Let's go back to my days with CrossFit 808. Any workout where I was paired with Elise Umeta, she was a bandsaw. And Elise had that crazy skill of just being able to die or skill or mental toughness, whatever she was drinking, she had all of it. And she would die in every workout when you were paired with her. Um you were forced to die with her and uh, <laughs> it sucked. It didn't matter what it was. It was always harder with her because she was so intimidating to work with. And, and that's a funny thing to say, considering that she's like five, three hundred and twenty pounds, but she's a maniac. <laughs> you know, what's funny is uh, I was, what's her name? Lindy Barber, who's okay. on the, the mayhem team with uh, Rich Froning. The, okay. Now she is, you know who I'm talking about? Uh, no, not exactly. I'm sorry. I'll have to, I'll have to yeah. uh, freshen up. So she's, uh, she's, yeah, she's just one of the members of uh, CrossFit Mayhem on the, on the mm -hmm. team. And, uh, before she was a member of the team, this is a few years ago. Um, I had never like actually worked out or trained with, uh, a CrossFit games athlete before, you know, at, at okay. any, at any level. And, uh, so we were at Froning's gym and they, we were doing this like, uh, like team partner workout and like we got teamed up together and mm. I was like, well, you know, this, like, I know that she's really fit, but I'm a dude, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, so, yeah. so I, I should Famous be, last word. Yeah, I should be okay. That, and uh, maybe that was an incorrect thought uh, for many reasons. I wasn't trying to be sexist. I just was trying to give myself a little bit of confidence in going into that. Yeah, yeah. And dude, the, I don't even remember the workout. I just remember we won, uh, <laughs> but for like, I think it was like five days, I couldn't really move very well. Like nice. we did like a bunch of GHD sit-ups and all this crap. And like, uh, cause one person got to, you didn't get to rest. You got to be on the rower while the other person was doing the work. And it was like wall balls and GHDs and all this other crap. Anyway, long story short, uh, I'd never been worked so hard in my entire life. Um, so I kind of know where you're coming from there. That's crazy. Well, and that speaks to this idea and something that we talk about with, talk about a lot on our podcast and, and what I try to um, relate to my athletes is that there's a big difference between competing and training and, and to get willy nilly with a, a special group, you know, you're going to cross at mayhem and, and hang out with this team. Yeah, it's a special moment and, and you should go for broke on that day. But you know, you, it's a great example there about how you cannot 
train like that every day because you'll be out every fifth day with some kind of injury. So now I think that's a great story. I think it's pretty common. And I think that's the big thing that makes these CrossFit Games athletes. It's not a special program. A lot of times it's not that they're particularly – well, they're, they're very talented, but I think their talent comes from within, and it's just this ability to – just kill themselves and these are masochists these kind of self-torturing maniacs um but uh more power to them they can do it it's uh it's not something i ever enjoyed or not something that it i never earned that um that characteristic through osmosis even even working hand in hand with the least quite a bit but you were there man you were there <laughs> <laughs> you're you you're, Hanging you're not on, you're not giving <laughs> yourself enough credit because one thing I do, like, I, since yeah. then, I have worked out with a few CrossFit Games athletes. Yeah. And one thing that I notice, uh, the the main difference, kind of what you're saying, that, like, ability to push is, like, if you were to draw it out on a graph, the intensity level over the course of time, is most people, like, come up, they kind of peak, and then maybe it drops down, and they can either maintain that level or they hit too hard, and it just really falls off until the workout's finished. And for, you know, people at the Games competition level, like you were in, it's like just this almost like this steady vertical curve until the workout's over. And yeah, like I can't even fathom it. It's like so painful. Like I, I don't even understand that level of fitness, man. So much respect for a lot of the things you've you've been through over the years. Ooh. I appreciate it. I don't get a lot of respect in the house. You know what I mean? So it's cool to, it's cool to get it on your podcast, so thank you. <laughs> All right, man. In your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Um, um having kids. I mean, honestly, uh, really being a parent, I think that is going to be it because there's nothing. I think mental toughness really shows itself when like your world becomes chaos. Um, so we can all be riding high when things are easy and things are going as expected. But if anyone out there is a parent, um, that's not going to happen. You know, you, you have these well laid plans and then for whatever reason, something happens and, and you got to switch gears and roll with the punches. So if you want to test your mental toughness, uh, take on the challenge of juggling three kids. You don't necessarily have to, um, to make the babies, but, uh, find a, find a parent with three kids and give that guy a night off and, um, see how mentally tough he can be. Yeah. And that's the, when that's another thing is like, it's the, it's the journey of having kids that I've found is like, <laughs> if you were to just be like, Hey man, you got one day. Cause like, uh, my wife, she's a stay at home mom. She does like, yeah. she does all the work. Right. But then, like, oh like, well, and let me—I'll interrupt you real quick. I, I can say she does do all the work because we met up when you came up to uh, Stone Barns here, and we ran around the farm, and I wasn't carrying my daughter around because I was making her do the work. And, <laughs> and uh, your wife, your wife ended up carrying one of your boys and my kid. You know, so uh, your wife does do the work, and she ain't afraid to. Tough, tough woman there. Yeah, she does. But like, so she <laughs> she'll go out of time, like go out of town, like maybe once, twice a year. It's, it's not very like. Um, not a very frequent thing, but then that it, you know, it's all me for like three or four days or whatever. Um, and so what I, I try to do is just like really hone in and be like the best parent I can, you know, you have these plans, right. And then like all <laughs> yeah. the, you know, what is it? The, the best plans don't survive, uh, you know, first contact or your first punch in the mouth. And that's kind of what the, the reality is of like over time is like, maybe you can have like a perfect or a really good like day or a couple of hours, but man, it's the grind of just doing it over time. And I've never heard someone say be a parent for mental toughness, but it's so true. Uh, I think that's an awesome, awesome answer. Yeah, anyone out there who's a good parent um, probably has some innate quality that's just they, they're good at stuff. They're good at something. Uh, I don't necessarily know what that is, but uh, parent parenting is it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, it continues to be the hardest thing I'll ever do. Um, but equally, it's just as fun. I mean, if you could only have one piece of equipment to train with for the rest of your life, what would it be? Yeah, it's probably anyone who's listening. Uh, it's probably the barbell. I think it's I think it's a great piece of equipment, even empty. You can do a lot of stuff with it. Um, you know, you can push it, pull it, press it, weightlift with it, carry it around. Um, it's something I liked. It's the only reason I was any good at football. I had good training and conditioning coaches, and um, they taught me how to use it right. And um, through that, I can get a lot of work done pretty quick. So uh, the barbell, love it, but um, use it use it appropriately. Awesome. All right, dude, the question of the show, what is the best advice you have for becoming a better human? This is 100% open-ended. Yeah, this might seem interesting. Um, oh, man, for me, what's made me the best human and what's make, what makes me a better person is my wife. 
um, in some way, some shape or form, I found the right person to spend the rest of my life with. And I would say, don't be picky. Um, don't be overly choosy, I guess, either. But, um, you know, if you focus on the relationships, uh, with the people around you and, and work and help those be better and help those grow, the rest of the stuff kind of takes care of itself. I think with, with all this social media and all these different fitness plans and us being busy with work, we forget about what's most important. And, and it's generally the people who are closest to you. So, um, man, I would say if you, if you focus on being a better human, um, probably the best way to do that is to treat other humans properly and, 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 and start that with, you know, your esposa, um, start that with your, your significant other, whoever that may be, or, you know, if you just like flying solo, you know, give your mom and dad a call. I think they'd appreciate it. I have a lot of respect for that answer, man. That was uh, that's a good one. All right, man. I'm sure a lot of people want to learn more about you and what you're up to. We already mentioned the Doc and Jock podcast, yep. but feel free to plug it again. Uh, what are you doing? Where can people find out more about you? Yeah, check out www. Or yeah, who says that anymore? Check out docandjock.com. That's where all the podcast stuff is. Um, our interview was on there uh, that we did with you and a couple other ones. We've interviewed some neat guys. Uh, Rob Wolf recently. We had a we had one sleep expert that co- it's coming on a guy named Jeff Drummer, um, who's unbelievable. So that, that's general fitness stuff, kind of similar to your podcast with their own little take on it. And then um, for for weightlifting content and. Uh, yeah, that's joesbarbell.com. That's where we're putting some stuff out there. And I'm trying to get better, Jared, about uh, making content more accessible to people. But, um, yeah, Joe's Bar- and I'm pretty active on Instagram if I do that. I do Instagram because I can kind of uh, – I can link all the other accounts to it. So um, there we're always doing little tutorials. And, um, you know, I have an interesting little training partner. I have a taxidermy squirrel that I keep in the garage. So even when I train alone, uh, me and Coach Dush – my taxidermy with the squirrel kind of get after it. So, um, you know, people may not want to learn too much, um, <laughs> if they, if they start to go, uh, too far down that rabbit hole. But, um, you know, I try to keep things fun and personable. And, um, a lot of my coaching or training or anything is, is a direct result of what I'm actually practicing. So, um, I definitely believe in, um, practicing what you preach, leading from the front and, and not just kind of giving folks willy nilly crazy, uh, I'm not some mad scientist who hasn't done it. Everything I prescribe is something I've definitely done or, or tried to do. So, Awesome. And I highly recommend everyone go check uh, the podcast out, your your website cool. out, everything. I think it's uh, all great stuff, man. But I really do appreciate your time. Thank you so much uh, for being on the show today. No, it's fun. It's fun being on this end of it. Like I said, I, we were talking earlier. Um, I think the podcast, uh, this this place for whether you call it entertainment or education is just it's a it's an unbelievable resource and i'm still floored by how many people don't know about it um but um you know get out there listen to podcasts great stuff and um jared man i appreciate you buddy thanks for having me on thanks man always whine about their best. <laughs>